You are listening to the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, a member of the Shameless Podcast Network. Welcome to the Choose Your Struggle Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Schiffman. On this show, I interview people with lived and learned experiences on the subjects of mental health, substance misuse and recovery, and drug use and policy, but occasionally we talk about other topics as well. Today's episode is a special feed drop. It's me on the I'm the Villain podcast with host DeAndre Jones and Isabel Knight. But first, Kid Mental, let's go. Things ain't always gonna go our way. But you can always win when you just struggle. And some battles of the yesterday. But today is for a new weekend. You just struggle. And don't worry about what they say. But you can always win when you just struggle. And you can bounce back. Just as you. Come on in, listen in to just struggle. In June of 2021, I accomplished something that is all too rare for those with lived experience. I told my story and made my call for change from a TED stage. The fact is, our society puts too much emphasis on those with learned experience. You know, the person who spent 20 years researching something. And that's okay, because those voices are incredibly important. They provide the information that the rest of us run with. But we can't minimize the voice of those who've actually lived these experiences. That person doing research can't tell you what it really feels like to go through withdrawals, and they shouldn't want to. We need all voices at these tables. So if you're looking for someone who actually has lived these experiences, who can talk about struggling with mental health and substance misuse, who can talk about what it really feels like to go through addiction, who can speak eloquently about the war on drugs from both a learned and lived experience, reach out to me. And if you're looking to create a more complete experience, a round table or whole cadre of speakers, I can bring numerous people with me who have experiences that are unlike mine and unlike anything else that you've heard. So reach out to me today and let's create a complete learning experience for your office, your club, your school, or anywhere else, because these voices need to be heard and these lessons can create change today. Reach out and let's all choose our struggle. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends. If you're listening on Apple, please rate and review or check out the review link in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. What are you going to do, right? And I think back to when I was at my worst. And if I had to choose between a possible OD or going through withdrawal, I'm going to go with the possible OD because withdrawal is the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. And I, I feel for these people who are making that choice literally every day because I've been there and it sucks. Welcome back to I'm the Villain. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that is is honestly pretty difficult for me personally to talk about as someone who's like a, a vehement anti-drug or like non-drug user. Um, but we're going to be talking about drugs. And today we have Jay Schiffman on, who is the host of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Um, and I'm just going to let you give a quick intro, whatever you think the audience should know about you. Well, hi, uh, both of you. Thank you for having me, it, Isabel. It's been great getting to know you over the last couple months. And DeAndre, great to meet you. Uh, I am Jay Schiffman. I'm a speaker, a storyteller, uh, the host of the Choose Your Struggle podcast, as well as a couple of uh, live and, and uh, virtual storytelling events. Uh, I am a guy in long-term recovery who is not sober, and another way to put that is I am a drug user. I'm actually, right before we got on here, uh, as I was telling Isabel, I was just back in Cincinnati going through some old stuff, moving all that, and I found my journals, which I only brought because I'm working with a writer on a book about my experiences uh, being in a lockdown unit in the long-term care facility, what we would have called a mental institution 50 years ago, and this journal specifically was from my time in the mental institution. And right before we got on here, I was reading, I read the first month, uh, you know, they're, each of them is a page, page and a half long. And one of the pages I'm writing about how they all are congratulating me on my sobriety because at the time I was like a practicing, this is not a joke, I was a practicing Rastafarian Jew. And so uh, weed is sacred, but like everything else you're supposed to abstain from, right? And 
they're again they're 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 patting me on the back for being sober and at the time i was like all about that and now i look back and go but i was completely and and totally addicted to my medication and nobody there was no consideration of that right because that was all medication Mm -hmm. there was like oh good job you know person now here i am 11 years in recovery going but i was i was so badly struggling with addiction Mm -hmm. And no one was willing to call it that. So that's how convoluted right. this, it's this, so convoluted. this discussion is. Like what's is considered okay that, and what's not. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. In the face of like changing, yeah. aggressively changing times. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and even and in like the standards. prescribed drug world, right? Like, you know, I like this guy, Slate Star Codex DeAndre, who is like a psychiatrist in San Francisco. And he talks about like, you know, how he just prescribes Adderall. Like that's like 90% of what he does. And like, we're all <laughs> like, you know, th- th- this particular community is just like all an Adderall to do their like day to day lives and do their jobs. But it's just like, at what point is it like, what is the ethics of like taking drugs to like fix a problem to sort of get you up to sort of like the mean of what the rest of society is doing versus like at what because i feel like that's considered like okay and then to do anything more than that to try to get above sort of the mean feels unethical right of people who like you know take adderall in unhealthy ways right or i don't know that's the question is is it unhealthy or not like who's to say right (laughs) well so let me let me actually take that point you just made is about which is a really good one about adderall even a step farther Chemically, and this is something that I love, and I think a lot of people know this now, but chemically, Adderall and meth are sisters. I mean, they're the the molecule, there's one molecule different between the two. The difference is one of them has a safe supply, Adderall, right? We know what we're getting at Adderall. There's no fentanyl in it. There's no, you know, here in Philly, we're seeing Trank, which is a tranquilizer, show up in a lot of our drug supply now. None of that's in Adderall, right? Because the big pharmace- pharmaceutical companies are making it. You know what strength it is. You know it's it's not you know diluted. You know all this kind of stuff. Math, you have no idea. And so if if you can think, all right, we as a country, we as a world, don't really have an issue with you know, I mean campuses being overrun with Adderall, right? Okay, maybe they shouldn't do that, but it's not a thing we're mobilizing the streets. If campuses are overrun with meth. How quick do you think it would be before our politicians will be trying to do mm-hmm. something? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they are almost literally the yeah. same thing. Yeah, totally. Um, and then I guess, DeAndre, do you want to give your <laughs> like, my drug, drug stance? background, I, mean, sure. I guess? I, I don't know. Um, like... As to not snitch on myself, I will <laughs> I will um, I will give a, a, you know, a glossed over version. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, no, I. I'm a very big, unsurprisingly, a very big proponent of harm reduction, you know, the treatment of drug addiction as a medical issue and not, you know, decriminalization. I'm very big in support of that. As far as like recreational drug use goes, you know, I think that people should be able to do what they want. And I think that, you know, I have been seen and known to partake in some at some times. I'm not a big, I'm not a regular marijuana user, nor am I a regular, um, any other kind of like quote unquote frowned upon drug. I drink frequent I drink frequently and sometimes I drink coffee. <laughs> um but yeah, that's that's where I'm at with that. So I love that we're okay, kind cool. of three different spots in the spectrum here. Isabel yeah. at the other end, like I don't do anything other and I'm assuming you drink coffee. Uh you know I don't drink coffee. I don't do any No anything. alcohol, no nothing. No substances. No, amazing. I've never met anyone like that. No substances whatsoever. Uh, but I'm, do you eat sugar? Yeah, I eat sugar. All right, so you at least one drug. You've got sure. one in you. Um, <laughs> and then DeAndre, you're like halfway down. You know, you're actually I would say more progressive, more more than halfway down. Yeah. And then you have me all the way at the other end. I'm standing here next to a weed plant I'm growing in my office, and I just finished growing mushrooms. So uh, all the way at the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. So, yeah, would you, tell us more about sort of what your, you know, when you talk about like being recovery, just like kind of what your story is in relation to drugs. Yeah. So this, as, as I kind of alluded to earlier, my understanding of my own drug use really didn't sort of uh, come full circle until like the last couple five years, I would say. I was put on medication as a, as a preteen in, in the late 90s, as were many people in our generation. 
Uh, but the, the, these stats are important, so I always say them. When I was born in 1986, there were roughly 350,000 young people in this country who were treated for ADHD or the, the umbrella of disorders underneath that. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the time I was diagnosed in the late 90s, that was 2 million. And so uh, there was no other medical condition that grew as quickly as ADHD did in the between the 80s and 90s. And, and I once gave that uh, or, or used those stats when I was giving a speech. And literally a woman came up to me afterward and said, it's so good that we don't do that anymore. And I said, lady, we're at four and a half million yeah, what now. Do you mean? We are, we're, we're still going on this journey. Uh, so, so. And I want to make this clear when I when I tell that joke, it's not because I think that we shouldn't have these prescription pills. They're really good for some people. But if you can tell me that four and a half million young people in this country are, are, are prescribed medication for this disorder, I'm going to say, OK, clearly that's an overprescription. There is no reason that we should be having that many people. And I don't know if that would I, like if I would qualify that, I mean, I was rambunctious, right? I, I was more interested in making people laugh than paying attention in school. But I think with the right guidance, I could have avoided medication. Unfortunately, I didn't. And my therapist put me on it. And, and, and this was at a time when, you know, we were going, I was going through puberty and we all remember how much fun that was. And I'm a guy who struggles with my mental health. I've always had anxiety and depression issues. I have OCD uh, and, and these things were not managed. And so all of that wrapped up in one, that perfect storm was diagnosed as something else because that's what, you know, doctors do when, when they make mistakes. And instead of seeing the, the symptoms of this bigger issue, my therapist gave it a name, bipolar disorder. And so by the time I was in my late teens, I was being treated for that too. Uh, now I do not have bipolar disorder. And <laughs> when you're treated for things that you do not have, bad things happen. Uh, by my early 20s, I was completely dependent on uh, the over five different medications I was taking every day. By uh, about a year later, I'm 22 and I am mentally and physically dependent, what we would call addicted to these medications. Uh, if you've seen the show House with his Vicodin, that was me with Clonopin, just popping them multiple times a day by the handful. Mm -hmm. And at 23, uh, in, I just turned 23 in the summer of 2009, I attempted suicide twice in two days. I overdosed. I spent three weeks in a lockdown unit, three months in a long-term care facility, what we would have called a mental institution 50 years ago, and then the next three months going through a uh, step-down detox, which is the opposite of cold turkey. Uh, to get all of that out of my system. And the the most important part of that story is is when I finally got everything out of my system, I was not recovered. Like that's not how this works. It took me a solid five years to feel that my body, my brain, my maturity had all kind of caught up with itself. And uh, so I, 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 while I do say that I entered recovery in, in 2010, I truly got healthy in 2015, 2016. And that's when I started telling my story. Nice. So Talk about your, um, I'm always interested in people that are recovering from addictions and still choose to, you know, like partake in marijuana or, you know, sort of like still choose to, you know, partake in substances in some degree. Talk about, yeah, like that part of yourself and what, what brought you there. Well, there's a very important word and that is mindfulness, mindfully mindful use of substances. This is the kind of situation where I never struggled with alcohol and I'm very happy about that because being from the Midwest uh, where whiskey flows like water, you know, that was that would have been a problem. I can have a drink and not need 10. Uh, I couldn't feel that way about my prescription pills. Like I said, I would just knock them back and I'm reading in these journals the way my mind was warped by this that you know, I, I had a stressful day. I'm, I'm fighting with another patient in this. And the next line, I said, I went and got more pills, you know, and they just gave them to me. So that was where my mind was, is that any negative feeling, any, any struggle in my life, the answer was more pills. And when your dealer is, is your doctor or CVS and Walgreens, it's super easy to just go get more pills. So the difference is now as, 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 a, as a healthy person, I am able to use mindfully, right? I know, okay, uh, if I am feeling a certain way about something, I mean, honestly, the one I struggle with the most is coffee. I don't use that mindfully. I get up every day and have a glass of coffee, a cup of coffee before I really can think straight. That is my biggest addiction now. But Smoke, uh, smoke in a bowl, or I'm a big proponent of CBD, which is for those listeners who are not as familiar, uh, that is the non, um, 
well, let's say psychoactive part of, of cannabis, uh, the, the, the anxiety reducing uh, aspects of it are incredible. And, and so, you know, I can smoke a bowl of that, be completely clear headed and, and yet I will feel my anxiety go away. I understand why some people would look at that and say, oh, you know, you're using um, you're using something as a crutch. But that's if that's the way you think about this, then what do you say to a person who truly needs psycho, you know, psycho medication, who truly needs you know, benzodiazepines to function every day? I mean, I would say personally, if they need that crutch to live, they need that crutch to live. We don't tell a person who has a broken leg, you shouldn't be using that crutch. So just being able to think about these substances in a, in a way that separates it from the way we were taught during uh, D.A.R.E. and just say no is super important. And and as I kind of was, was kidding with Isabel earlier, you know, sugar, in, in fact, is one of the, the drugs that most people use in an unmindful way, right? I, I have that problem. I, I had some cookies in the house. They're gone now. I didn't even enjoy them. They are. <laughs> <laughs> they are just gone. Uh, and it was because I could not not eat those. Right. So that's sort of the difference between how we think about some of these things. And if, if you were to tell me that, that, you know, something is more dangerous than sugar or say more compulsive than sugar. ooh man, I would have to disagree with you just based on my own experiences. Obviously, there's like so many different factors in terms of like what creates this this stigma around drug use and i do think that like yeah the the compulsivity or like the sort of addictive quality of of it is definitely one of them and i feel like that's partially why a lot of people like you know the metric by which a lot of people sort of judge like what drugs they feel like are okay right like i feel like in in a lot of the spaces that i'm in most people are like oh yeah like marijuana and like psychoactive like you know like the hallucinogenics and whatnot are all okay because they are less addictive and you know things like cocaine or whatever are considered like bad and like that's how like they'll broadly sort of classify which drugs they sort of feel okay with i'm curious like do you have some sort of like you know similar way of i mean i assume that you think there are some drugs that are bad right for sure uh I'm going to surprise you and say the answer is okay. no. Um, okay. So, so what, yeah, what are your thoughts so, on that? So uh, there's a guy named Carl Hart who's one of my heroes. And if, if y'all haven't heard of Carl Hart, he's he's a guy who's changing the game. Um, okay. He's a, he, he works at Columbia. Uh, first off, he's just a black, really good looking black guy with dreads. And so you when you think of Columbia, <laughs> you don't think of that, which I already think is amazing. But also he, yeah. he approaches drug use. Um, as uh, he talks about his own drug use, which is incredible, but also he is, I mean, he studies the impact on the brain. And according to his research, the likelihood of, of anyone using a particular substance to become addicted you know, we were taught is like 90%, right? I mean, Dare told us, look, if you smoke you know, crack, you're going to get addicted. The stats say so. Not true. Uh, in fact, the most uh, addictive, let's let's put aside sugar and nicotine and all these ones that we know are should be, you know, considered more <laughs> yeah. dangerous than they are for a second and talk about the ones that are considered more dangerous. Uh, the highest propensity for addiction is, is you know, street, um, I, I believe it's meth and then quickly followed by heroin. And those are under 20% of users will ever uh, develop an issue of misuse, which covers a lot of things. Actual addiction, full-blown medical addiction, like what I went through, is minuscule. We're talking 8% for the most uh, most addictive drugs. In fact, the average user of any substance, and now we do have to bring back in nicotine, um, alcohol, that kind of thing. The average user, the chances of being uh, developing an addiction is about 4%. So... When you learn these stats, you are able to go, oh, shit, like we were lied to about all of this. Right now, misuse is bigger and misuse is a lot of things. Misuse covers the kid who binge drinks on the weekend, which we all did back in college. Right. That is definition misuse. It also develops or in, in covers a person who is on their way to addiction, but is not quite there yet. I mean, again, addiction is a medical term that we kind of throw around a lot. There are I'm looking at the DSM five, the diagnostic manual for for um, uh, mental health issues is right here in front of me. You have to check certain qualifications mm-hmm. to be given that diagnosis of addiction. However, misuse covers addiction and these other things that are also 
let's let's not mince words here. I mean, are very dangerous as well. But again, when we're talking about the propensity for any sort of ill effect, the top three, and I, I just looked this up because it was in my TED talk back in June, the top three substances of any kind. I mean, we're talking death. We're talking about other ill effects. We're talking about the amount of people that it gets every year are all legal. And those are alcohol, it's tobacco, and it's sugar. Those top three are the ones that kill or hurt the most people every year. And if you look at all the other use, I mean, it is gaps between those and, and, and the next you know uh, group of, of, of drugs. In fact, nicotine is so high that if you did a graph, I mean, you couldn't put them all in the same graph because nicotine is so high above everything else that you'd have to squash it to get all the other ones down there at the bottom. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't know that the... the the rates of addiction were so low. I guess is the takeaway from that is that like we consider addiction to be a bigger problem than, than it actually is. So it's two things. No, yes, it, we do consider it to be because uh, the, 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 the actual, the actual diagnosis of addiction is very misunderstood. Uh, what I went through is addiction. You know, the kid who uh, I, I know that actually let me, this is a firsthand experience. I was working with a family back in South Carolina. The mom told me that the kid was struggling with addiction. And I said, oh, my God, you know, tell me about it. And while you smoking weed and you smoking weed. That's why we think these things are a lot bigger, oh, more overblown than they are. As you kind of alluded to before, so to kind of clear up something right there, while cannabis can be mentally, you can become mentally dependent on cannabis, you, it is not physically addictive. And so because of that, you cannot actually be addicted to cannabis. Same thing with, with um, psychoactive drugs. So uh, psilocybin, LSD, they are not physically addictive. And while you, become, you can become mentally dependent on them, you cannot be diagnosed as being addicted to those drugs because they do not fit the qualifications. Mm -hmm. So again, this misunderstanding is why we think this is such a bigger problem. And also because throughout our history, it's really interesting. And again, I know we're going to get into the war on drugs here, but we have been led to believe that there have been these periods of intense um, spikes in addiction. And in reality, that's never been the case. All there has been is either a new drug that got into vogue. And so, of course, you're seeing more people get addicted to it because it didn't exist before. Or B, the media has started to cover something. We're seeing this right now. I and mean, we're kind of at the end of the opioid epidemic. Don't get me wrong, the spike in overdoses is tragic. The amount of people who are struggling with this is tragic. However, the rates, if you, it, when you separate them from other causes, are not that much higher than the 90s when heroin was a major, major problem for a lot of uh, what, what we like to call subcultures, most uh, specifically you know, around Kurt Cobain and sort of the grunge movement. And there wasn't that much attention because, quite frankly, the media didn't care. But now all of a sudden that it's the white middle class and it's upper class that are struggling with these things. It is front page news. That's more about us as a society than it is about the drugs. Definitionally, the purposes of this conversation, are we when we like when we say addiction, are we talking about, you know, a thing that when you use it multiple times, like chemically alters the makeup of your body to like so that you know, your body becomes dependent on the introduction of these chemicals. Like it's a physiological effect. Yes. So that's part of it. Uh, it's mental and physical dependency. They both must be there to be qualified as addiction. Mm -hmm. The 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 you, you make a good point, though. So we have in recent years started to think of addiction uh, as in what they call the disease model. And so they focus very uh, extensively on the way it rewires your brain. They're not wrong. That does exist. But as some really incredible thinkers, a guy named Zach Rhodes, who I was just talking to not long ago, was, was really focused on this. He was like, but a lot of things rewire our brains. Sex we rewires our brains. And even those of us who are not addicted to, to sex, which can happen, it rewires our brains. So, so simply focusing on the rewiring is not really enough. There needs to be all these other factors, including um, the, 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 the realization that it is causing problems in your life and a continued use, uh, a desire to quit at some time. These are, there's, there's about seven different qualifications and you have to hit, if I, don't, if I remember correctly, it's either four or five of them to actually be given the diagnosis of addiction. And that's why people like me are trying to, to, to bring the, the, the term substance misuse into more of a um, an accepted uh, place in, in just casual society because 
if we only focus on addiction, again, that's a really small number, but there are other problems that come with drug use and and, and those need to be addressed as well. I mean, I, as a person who believes in, you know, everybody's right to do this, I'm not naive to think that, that you know, every it, that everyone is using safely. I work with people on a weekly basis who are not doing so, but but those people aren't getting the help that they need or if they are, if, if they're being focused on at all, it's just this sort of outdated idea about their drug use that, that is the hyper focus of, of what's going on in their lives. Yeah. So you can be just as chemically addicted as somebody else, but if you don't see it as a problem, you wouldn't be classified as addicted? Not necessarily. Uh, so again, there are multiple classifica- or, or qualifications and you okay. have to hit a certain so hit number the other of ones. them. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, that's the... Was, I'm going to say this really clearly, by the way, I do not defend the DSM-5. I think it is incredibly outdated. A perfect example, um, there is, there's a really famous case about a guy who clearly had PTSD. He had a couple of the, the um, qualifications, and I mean fully, any armchair psychologist would have given him a diagnosis of PTSD, but he didn't qualify because the DSM required you to have, I think it was four at the time. Uh, that might have been the fourth version, the fifth version out now, it might be less. All of that to say, this isn't perfect, and and this yeah. is still developing. However, addiction is a medical term that we throw around a lot, and it it, it, it we wouldn't do that with cancer, right? I wouldn't hurt my foot and go, shit, I have cancer. But that's how we do. Oh, I drank last week. I'm addicted to alcohol. No, you're not. You just had no willpower. Like it, there's there is this uh, inequality between those yeah. two medical terms. It's like a it's like a depressed and depressed situation, right? Like people people say depressed or like say I'm feeling depressed today and that just means like that they're feeling sad and then there's like a clinical right. like, you know, a diagnosis for depression of things that are happening in your brain. Great example. But I mean, it's just a really difficult thing to sort of classify generally because a lot of the stuff is going on inside somebody's head, right? And it's like hard to come up with these external metrics of, you know, how to to come up with a real justifiable definition that's going to like make everyone satisfied right well you're not going i I think that's a good uh, you're not going to make everyone satisfied i would also though say to to, i I like using the cancer example because it forces people to think about this a little bit differently you're not wrong it's a very personal thing whether or not somebody actually is struggling with addiction the way it is with any disease right would you can you imagine having to argue with somebody you actually have cancer (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, we, we have a medical situation where the doctor says you have cancer and they go, fine. But we've we've bastardized addiction to the point where it is actually an argument we have to have. And so what I and a lot of really um, smarter than me thinkers are, are, are trying to propose to people is that we roll addiction back into the medical world the way everything else is, right? Why do you have to go to a separate clinic to be treated for addiction? Why do you, you know, if you get caught with something, why are you forced into, this happens to a friend of mine, they were forced into treatment, they didn't have an addiction. It's just the way our court treats these things. So being able to separate the, the fact that these items are oftentimes criminalized from the actual health of a person is the only way we're actually going to reach a point where these people who need this, as I did 10 years ago, 11 years ago, can be treated the way that they need. So there, I think there are two avenues that I really want to explore with you, Jay. And one, uh, we talked about this before the show, is like a bit of the history of the criminalization of drugs in this, in this country, right? Like maybe with a focus on the, on the war on drugs. But then I also do want to pick your brain about, and maybe this one can come first, like whether you think, whether you think that some of these drugs that we know to be quote unquote more dangerous, like opioids or meth or heroin, you know, is, I, I guess the question that I'm thinking of is whether you think this is an issue and how you think we should address it. Well, to answer that second question, I would say there is not a perfect solution. And obviously, if if I had that answer, I, I would hopefully be somewhere <laughs> meeting with, with Biden. Um, I will say that there's one model that a lot of people look to as the next step in this evolution. We call it the Portugal model because it was implemented in Portugal. Uh, what they did in 2000 and it was either 2000 or 2001, I think it was 2001. They decriminalized all drugs. They did not legalize. Now, Mm -hmm. as someone who believes that legalization is the right answer here because then you get safe supply, 
again, this is not perfect. However, what they do have there is for people who are struggling to the point that they cannot exist without a drug. And, and the one you hear talked about the most is heroin, uh, because it's it's the drug that I think a lot of people, uh, when they envision a, a society that terrifies them around drug use, usually it's heroin. So what they do there is is if you are caught you are given compassion, which is the first thing that we do not have in our society. Yeah. There is no compassion in the way we treat drug users at all, and especially those struggling with addiction. But next is there are actual heroin clinics in Portugal where those who are otherwise leading a healthy life can go and get their heroin. And, and obviously the hope is at some point you won't go anymore. However, there's no forcing of this and, and, and that's a really important point because here we have suboxone we have um uh, 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 other drugs that are used to treat people who are struggling and want to get off of opioids uh but there's always this question of but how long do they have to use this for we don't think about again i hate to come back to the same example but it but it helps people think if somebody gets on chemo, nobody's asking their doctor, but when can they get off it? They get off it when they're healthy. <laughs> I mean, that's that's just the way medication works. And so in Portugal, you are allowed to go until you don't need it anymore. And sometimes that's a long time. Other times, you know, when we fix the other problems in people's lives that that uh, lend themselves to people becoming uh, struggling with addiction you see people graduate. And in fact, that is a vast major majority of those who are supported into recovery will eventually graduate from addiction anywhere, not just Portugal. Here, we see that as well. But that's so alien to the way we think about these issues. A and quite frankly, what's, we're a much more conservative country, so I don't see that happening anytime soon. But, but we're seeing steps in this direction, right? I mean, we, we are finally getting the first safe consumption site in this country. Here in Philadelphia, we almost opened one last year and, and it didn't happen. So we're seeing steps. I mean, just 10 years ago, Neil exchanges were thought to be uh, all this crap. Mm -hmm. and, and it's still debated in some places, but in other places, it's just the norm. These are the steps we're taking in the right direction to help people who actually are struggling. To, to quote a guy who I love named David Poses, he said, nobody started using uh, heroin because needles were available and nobody ever stops because needles aren't available. All they do is help cut down on communicable diseases and they help uh, keep, the, keep the users safe. And, and when you think about it that way, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, we see this with a lot of things in, you know, in the U.S., right? I think I think of sex work. I think of, like, abortion access. When you, like, push something or when you make something illegal, it pushes the supply under, under, <laughs> under the black market. You know, it's, it becomes unregulated. And, like, that's when things get really dangerous. Like, obviously, as you said, you know, the drugs themselves are dangerous substances, but you know a lot of this is like the fact that people don't know where they're getting their supply from you know people are right. obtaining things that are laced with things and i think that what you just said hits on something else that's interesting it's that like if you can get something if you can get your fix you know above board through a clinic i'm guessing for little or no money then right. that's probably what you'll do and it also means that the supply is controlled for you and becomes a lot harder to od on something yes thank you for making that point the 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 people in portugal who who are getting it from the government aren't ODing because heroin in the right amount will not kill you it's what's mixed up in it right so i actually put out an episode of my show on this a couple of weeks ago I had a buddy, I have a buddy who lives in Seattle and he, and he texts me and he said, look, man, I know you, you know, you care about this stuff. I just don't know what to do. I'm seeing so many people using the open, like what the hell is up with this? And, and as Isabel knows, this is what I do on a weekly basis with an organization here in Philly. We go out in some of these neighborhoods that are hard hit by, by, you know, neglect and people who are completely ignored and we, and we work with them. And in most cases they are using out in the open. Um, so I'm not going to say that I, 
think he should feel bad for being uncomfortable. I get uncomfortable sitting there talking to them as they're shooting up, let's say in their neck, right? To, to me, seeing them shoot up in some dangerous parts of their body is very uncomfortable. I've gotten over my fear of, of people just kind of using around me, right? I mean, I was there for a long time, but, but if for someone who doesn't see that often, that's very upsetting. The reason you're seeing more of this is pretty straightforward. We have fentanyl in pretty much all of our drug supply now. And as I said earlier, we're also seeing Trank, which is a tranquilizer. The, the, the danger of overdosing is so high that if you were had two options, to if you don't know what's in your supply, because we don't have safe supply, either to use in a back alley where you could overdose and no one's going to find you, you're, you're going to die. Or in a park where if you go down, someone with like myself with Narcan hopefully is nearby or somebody's going to call 911. Which one are you going to do? And if your response is, well, then they shouldn't use if, you know, they, they don't know it's in the supply. Think about it this way. You go into a bar and you order a beer, except the person didn't tell you that this bottle is actually grain alcohol and you knock it back. Next thing you know, you're on the ground. That's where we are with the supply for all these other drugs. And if you're struggling with misuse or addiction to, to alcohol, and you know that there's a possibility that you're gonna get grain alcohol, but you can't not drink, what are you going to do, right? And I think back to when I was at my worst, and if I had to choose between a possible OD or going through withdrawal, I'm gonna go with the possible OD because withdrawal is the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. and. I, I feel for these people who are making that choice literally every day because I've been there and it sucks. Mm -hmm. So do we all like agree with the central premise of like if we had our ideal society, we would have less drug use than we have now? I think I think I think not necessarily for me. I don't know. I mean, like, I think ideal society means that like people feel less need to escape from their reality. So maybe by the transitive property, yes, right? But I think that ideal society also means that people should be able to, you know, partake in things that they want to partake in and feel supported while they do it. I mean, like, the goal of this Portugal model that you're talking about, Jay, right, is to get people to use drugs less, right? Uh, I would say to use drugs safer. Uh, okay. And, and, and part of that means less addiction and we have to separate those two right again you know if only let's say the average person four to eight percent well that's 92 to 96 percent who can use drugs safely and, and so kind of going back to my facetious example from earlier if i'm thinking of my ideal society it is full of cookies man and <laughs> i'm i'm drink i'm eating cookies all the time i'm eating ice cream I love that stuff. Well, that to me is actually a more dangerous drug than cannabis, right? You can't OD on cannabis. Cannabis isn't going to give you diabetes. I know that, you know, this weight problem I got is mostly because of sugar. It's not because of cannabis. So I don't know it, whose ideal society there would be no drugs. I would say that it would be safe use and way less, in fact, no addiction, which again, we have to separate from, from all drug use. Yeah. I think back to my, <laughs> I was thinking about my ideal world and I was thinking like about some of my vices and I was like, well, my ideal world definitely has like hella brews. Like there's definitely mad beer in my ideal world, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I definitely still struggle with some of this like mental and societal block that society has put on me when I'm viewing of, or when I'm thinking about some of the more quote unquote illicit drugs like heroin and meth and stuff like that. I mean, I just have so little experience with it and I don't, you know, I'm so like kind of indoctrinated in like that these drugs are bad things that it's hard for me to like sort of think that liberally about that. But, you know, my logical brain is like, I'm sure that there are people that, you know, if, if they had a regulated and safe source and could only access it in a certain, like with a certain frequency could enjoy, you know, meth safely. But even coming out of my mouth, right? It feels like such an, an oxymoron. <laughs> well, so is this the part mm -hmm. where you want me to tell you why, like where that comes from and it, how it was all intentional? Sure. Yeah. So sure. the first anti-drug laws were passed in this country with the late 1800s and they were specifically targeted at one community. Do you want to guess which community that was? 1800s? Late 1800s. Interesting. On the West Coast, if that gives you a clue. 
Mexicans. Gold miners. Nope, that comes in the early 1900s. What'd you say? Miners. Yes, but who were the miners at the time? Oh, man. I mean, the answer is Chinese immigrants. People? Chinese immigrants. Oh. So this is why. Damn me. <laughs> so, so this You've is been why. God. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese immigrants were coming over and they were doing, we all know the story of the railroads and they were doing, they were building this country, right? Yeah. They brought with them a particular type of opium. Now, it wasn't the type that we were finding in white people's medicine cabinets that were, is in every one of our medicines from the 1800s. That was, you know, the mixes, the elixirs, all that kind of stuff. It was smokable opium. And the first anti-drug laws were specifically to eliminate smokable opium. Why? It's in the laws. And I say this a lot, that we are so lucky in this country that until about the 1950s, maybe a little earlier, the 1940s, the racism in this country was so out in the open that they wrote it into laws. Yeah. Now, after the 1940s, 1950s, it kind of becomes what we know we know now as dog whistle uh, racism, but before yeah. that, they used it to was not give a fuck. The they were like, no, not they at were all. right. Did not. They care. were right. Slurs right in the bills. Right. Fuck it. <laughs> yep. And so these original anti-opium laws specifically say that it is the type used by Chinese men who are using it to seduce white women. Right there, uh, and that is the first drug law. Right there. So you you take this idea that drugs are being used by the less desirables in this country to you know let's let's be let's be real here uh mixed races that's what everyone was terrified of back then and we see this again in the 1910s and 1920s specifically around two drugs and now we get into mexican immigrants and that's cannabis and the 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 marijuana act was was passed in 1914 it was not actually called that marijuana by the way is a completely made up word uh that was made up by people who were trying to see this drug eradicated uh, until then it was called cannabis and it was in all of our medication. You can still buy bottles, you know, antiques that say cannabis, you know, um, the same way you can buy Coca-Cola bottles that literally had cocaine in them. <laughs> so the reason they did this again was that they believed that for whatever reason that Mexican men were, were having relations with white women and that was undesirable. We see it again right after that. Uh, we're entering into the Roaring Twenties and what does that symbolize? Jazz. We all know this story, right? This is time and time and time again. Uh, things that are cool are usually black based that terrifies old white America. What do jazz musicians sometimes use? Heroin. So they've decided they have to outlaw heroin because it's it's making these white women want to be with. I mean, this stuff is just egregiously disgusting when you actually read it. So at this time, we're starting to see a guy come into to power and he actually gains power in 1930. His name is Harry Anslinger. This is a guy who's been forgotten to history. And in fact, he is, if not the most heinous of American, let's say monsters. Uh, I cannot think That's of a like worse a one. That's like a pretty high bar. It is a I very high bar. But when you hear <laughs> what he did, <laughs> you will understand. So Harry Anslinger knew all of this was bullshit. But Harry Anslinger was a open and avowed racist. I mean, like Harry Anslinger was censured on the floor of Congress in the 50s for being too racist. How <laughs> bad do you have to be to be censured on the floor of Congress before, let's say, 1980 for being openly racist? Strom Thurmond was a senator until the 90s or the early 2000s, right? Dude was a segregationist. No one cared. So that's how racist Harry Anslinger was. And he creates all of these laws and a lot of these myths that we know of that we still hear today, that marijuana makes you crazy. He came up with that one. He was the first what we would call the drug czar. Uh, he headed what is now the DEA. And he was the guy. He actually got a little famous last year. If you saw the movie, um, uh, the, the, the people versus uh, the people versus Billie Holiday, because Harry Anslinger was so alarmed that she would sing this song about lynching that he made it his mission to ruin her and he did in fact she was arrested for i think the fifth time in her hospital bed while she was dying of kidney disease so this man was was the founder of a lot of these myths that that were again based on overt racism 
I, I won't even go. I, I said some of these on my TED talk for the reason of making this point. I don't like saying them. They're so heinous. Just search for Harry Anslinger quotes. That's that's all I'm going to tell you to do if you're listening to this. So when Richard Nixon kicks off what we call the war on drugs, nothing was new. All he was doing was sort of bringing these ideas into one policy. And of course, as we know, Richard Nixon did this for for his Southern strategy, appealing to, to Southern white voters. Yep. And what's even more amazing about this is uh, a guy named Dan Baum, who just died last year, an incredible writer about this pol- about drug policy and the draw on, war on drugs. He interviewed John Ehrlichman not long before he died. And John Ehrlichman is one of the guys who goes down for Watergate. He was Nixon's chief advisor. And before he dies, Ehrlichman kind of had to come to Jesus about all the horrible things he helped Richard Nixon do. And he tells Dan Baum, look, we knew the drugs were not the problem. But we had a problem, I'm I'm paraphrasing here, we had a problem with the civil rights movement, the black civil rights movement, and hippies who were against the war on drugs. This this quote. We could not, right, really famous quote, we could not make it illegal to be black or against the war. However, we could make it illegal to smoke weed and use heroin and, and associate both of those with those communities. He goes on to say, do you know what I'm saying? I'm saying we knew this was all made up, but we did it anyways. So- This is where the war on drugs comes from. It's not new. It's Richard Nixon seeing, oh, shit, this has worked time and time and time again for me to be racist without being racist, to be against these groups without openly being against these groups. And he sets off this policy that then Ronald Reagan runs with and destroys literally generations of black and brown Americans. Yeah. For some just for some media checks, the movie is called The United States versus Billy Holiday. For those that want to watch it and it was only okay but it was based on a book that you should read called chasing the screen yeah. which is wonderful it's, it's uh it's rotten tomatoes tomato meter is low admittedly but yeah. i'm sure the movie is great i'm sure the book is great um i will read one harry anslinger quote just one because they do get pretty gross <laughs> um quote there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the u.s and most are negroes hispanics filipinos and, inter- and entertainers their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana usage. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. And and by the way, that's just scratching the surface. Yeah, it, it, gets, gets, it gets pretty racy. It gets worse real quick. <laughs> yeah. It gets pretty racy. He was... And remember, at the time, he's speaking for the United States government when he's saying these things. This is our policy. And so it's not hard to understand, okay, so... This is where this originates from. <laughs> then you go through this entire string of Nixon and Reagan to get to just say no and, and dare. And dare. Yeah. Literally all of us being taught in schools, if you use drugs, you will be arrested, you'll overdose, all this horrible stuff. It is institutionalized racism at this point that is one to one. I mean, it's all made up. And what's so really so terrible terrible is they knew dare didn't work the stats were there from the beginning there's a wonderful episode of you're wrong about everybody's favorite podcast yeah. about dare um just say no was actually this is uh, i had the author of this amazing book on my show named emily dufton who writes about how nancy reagan stole just say no from a from a black organization that had nothing to do with drugs it was all about trying to help kids learn and, and have after school programming in oakland she She comes to visit and decides to steal this program, whitewash it, make it just say no so that they could avoid doing anything else about drugs and then sells it to P&G so that you can have our Olympians telling kids don't do drugs. It is a pretty heinous example of whitewashing. And yet we all remember this as, oh, kindly old Nancy Reagan. No, she was terrible. (laughs) Um, You know, we can see like proof i mean there's obviously tons of proof of how racist this shit is and how it was meant to be racist but i think that one of the better examples of you know how clearly this was meant to target certain populations is the fact that you can just look up prison sentence average prison sentences for people that get caught for this stuff right i mean like it's we, we know this isn't about criminal justice we know this isn't about safety or whatever but if it was then we would see you know you know, we would see similar sentencing rates for people across the demographics. And we, we know that that's not the case. Um, 
Yeah. So this is, I want to, I want to, that's such an important point that I want to underscore by saying this, this is a really important stat in 2020. So uh, we, uh, marijuana was decriminalized in, in New York. Uh, medical is there. They're actually about to legalize. It's amazing. Right. In 2000, in 2020, 97% of those who were processed through the criminal justice system for cannabis were black. 97%. You cannot hear that stat and say that this is about anything other than race. <laughs> so wild. I think a lot of people don't realize how codified racism and like, you know, the like anti or how the how the government has like taken steps to quell anti-government movements and um, how that often also targets black people. Like it's it's in, you know, I think the most common example is like redlining, but it's it's everywhere. Right. And we see the remnants of that in the country today. I wanted to mention that. So you mentioned you're wrong about, and then Jay, as you were talking about the sort of the first like anti-drug laws, there is another very kind of famous and well circulated episode of, I think you're wrong about, about human trafficking and (laughs) the first human trafficking laws were very, like had very, very similar origins. It was like, these were laws were put in place so that the police or like the government could apprehend men of color that were seen with a lot of white women because it was assumed or you know the idea was like these white women could never be seeing these black men you know or you know these men of color on purpose so they must be like trapping and enslaving and trafficking these women i think what's so important by the way, that is a wonderful episode of that show. And I think we we, we can't give too many shout outs to you're wrong about. Uh, as a podcaster myself, I got to say, I think it's the best podcast out there right now. So um, what I think is so important is that we all recognize, OK, clearly forget what Republicans in the media are saying. Of course, their racism is is like ingrained in this in this uh, country that we, we live in. What's so startling, though, to your point, with Deandre, which I really appreciate, is that sometimes when we see it, we we go kind of like, oh, my God, there, too. Like, it's like <laughs> everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, it's like we get surprised by how deep and how hidden a lot of this stuff is. Yeah. I mean, it feels like a lot of these things. And this is also by design. Right. But a lot of this feels so, so noble. Right. Like I interned at a nonprofit called. Uh, walk free in college that is completely dedicated to like ending human trafficking right and let's be clear like forced labor especially forced labor and supply chains is a big problem but a lot of you know the narrative around human trafficking as it relates to the united states is you know either overblown or just like originates from like all out lies about how human trafficking works in the u.s but like you know, on its face, right? I was like, I felt like I was doing such good work. And I, I don't think I was doing bad work, right? I just think I was doing misguided work or like sure. work towards a cause that, you know, actually isn't that big of a deal or not. I don't want to say that big of a deal, but maybe my, it's slightly overblown for political purposes. I, I, I spent 10 years in the nonprofit world, man. I feel that in my soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like these, you can't, blame people for wanting to you know try to do good and that's what they think is is a a serious moral problem to be solved yeah for sure i never you know i that's why you know this is yet another example of how the blame so squarely falls on the system right yeah i would never blame someone working to you know working on like the opioid crisis or human trafficking because it seems like, like, like I said, on its face, such a good place to put your effort into. Well, and it probably still is, even if it's a disproportionately like represented problem. Yeah, I don't think those two. Right? I don't think these two things are one to one because I think that, like, you know, the opioid crisis, if the media. I think Jay's right. The media is talking about it, and the white it's affecting white people, and that's why people care about it. But it's sad that people are dying and overdosing, and that's not good. And we should be doing something about that. How we ad- how we address it, you know, is I think disputed, but for sure, it seems like from the episode of You're Wrong About, as I recall, that like, you know, human trafficking is the way that it's represented in policy and in law, is like oftentimes like weaponized against sex workers, you know. So like one might be actively harming somebody, whereas like working on the opioid crisis is probably like at least on some degree to some degree good work. 
I appreciate that that Isabel sort of said, and, and you made the point that it might still be. And I think that there needs to be a clarification between nice to have organizations and need to have organizations, right? I used to work for Make-A-Wish. Um, now, as and I can tell you firsthand, one of the sort of uh, greatest joy moments I've ever had is being there when this young girl was like given her wish, right? It was such a beautiful moment. And if every person we helped was like her, then this organization would have been incredible. It wasn't, and it sort of took the shine off the apple for me. But at the end of the day, Make-A-Wish isn't solving cancer. Make-A-Wish isn't keeping kids from dying. Make-A-Wish is just putting smiles on their faces. What if we were in a situation where they we had better health care so kids like that were getting the help they need, which a lot of times they weren't, right? That's the difference between a need to have and a nice to have organization. And a lot of the opioid epidemic work, you know, unfortunately has come down to nice to haves. You had people who were were trying to help educate, you know, uh, uh, places like um, uh, middle of Ohio, where I'm from, you know, some of these hard hit towns. But nobody was ta- nobody was advocating to their senators. They bring jobs back. Nobody was 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 calling for better health care. It was all well. These people should just know that they shouldn't use these drugs. And if we advocate better, I mean, most of them already know that this isn't good for them. But when the factory up and leaves, like, what are you gonna do all day? We know a lot of the variables that go into struggling with addiction. We don't know to what extent, right? I mean, and I think that that's shown so clearly by the fact that my one of my younger brothers, I'm the oldest of four, went through almost an exact same circumstance that I did. Never, you know, he wasn't misdiagnosed, but he was, di- you know, he had his own stuff. Never struggled with addiction, but I did. And we are almost literally the same person genetically, right? So we know a lot of these variables, we don't know to what extent, but we do know that life satisfaction, right? The, this is a major variable when it comes to struggling with addiction. And yet it's one of the ones we under we under pay attention to because fixing it means fixing our society in a way that a lot of the people don't want to do. Right. And so like for me, I think my goal is different from both of yours because I do want to see, you know, ideally zero drug use in our society, right? But I think that the only way to get there is not by doing the things that we've doing th- been doing thus far, right? In terms of like just pushing it underground and making people do more and more dangerous things. You have to fix the issues in our society that people are using drugs to cope with. Deal with poverty and hunger and, you know, violence in people's communities. Yeah. I still think that's a little I still think that's a little derivative of like the, you know, like <laughs> that it, drugs in themselves are inherently negative like i think in i think if people didn't have any issues they would probably still smoke weed because weed is you know pretty dope well i do <laughs> think they're they're very demonstrably correlated though i mean i do think that like you know alcohol for example is absolutely correlated with violence right like violence is correlated for with sure. a lot of these things right i don't think that that doesn't seem deniable for sure but me. i think that but i think that even even if you solve the problems i don't think people would stop drinking like i think i think people would do it i think people would drink less people would drink less for sure absolutely they would drink less but you said and some people maybe would stop drinking but you said that you wanted to bring it down to zero and i'm saying that like i think it would eliminate eliminate a lot of the like drinking to cope but a lot of i'm saying that a lot of people use drugs well, not, not just saying, to cope i'm not going to get i'm definitely not going to get my ideal society yeah for sure but yeah, yeah. but i'm let saying me, that let me ask you a question in terms though of the tools isabel right, to so get us there. yeah people it, it, so to your point about alcohol, like, yeah, I do think there's a lot of violence with it. However, when we're done here, I'm going to go have a glass of whiskey on the rocks and I guarantee you I'm not going to beat anybody tonight. So, you know, that there, there, there is some, but not for everybody. But when, when you say you want a drug free society, like I know you don't drink coffee and I don't know how the fuck you do that, but <laughs> are you envisioning I, a I world where drink nobody coffee. drinks coffee? Are you envisioning a world where nobody has a has a bran muffin for breakfast because it has sugar in it? Like, I'm honestly asking, like, how how would that even be physically like, how would that even be possible? I definitely feel like we the reason why it feels so impossible is because of, you know, path dependency. Right. And like, it's so hard to envision just in the same way it's so hard to envision in a society in which we didn't have these racist drug laws because it's happened, right? And that's what determines what our society is going to look like going forward. But, like, I, I think it's very easy to envision a society in which we didn't have these 
sort of plaguing our population. <laughs> like that is not hard for me in any way, right? I don't think it's realistic to assume that that will happen, but it's not hard for me to envision at all. But what's the negative if I get up in the morning and, have, and I, I love a good cup of coffee and I love what it does to me? What would be the benefit, I guess, is my question of getting rid of that? I just feel like anecdotally, there have been so many people I know, even with coffee, right, who came to feel as if their relationship with it was outside of their control and it was controlling them. Right. And they didn't want that, but they didn't feel as if they could do anything about it. Well, so and I feel like I know so many people in so, that situation. Uh, I definitely hear that, and as a coffee again, as a person who does not drink coffee mindfully, I think <laughs> that if there's any argument that those statistics that Carl Hart says are wrong, it is coffee because I don't know that many people who could skip a day of coffee and not feel the effects of of skipping it. Right? I mean, I'm talking about withdrawal, withdrawal like yeah. literal withdrawal. However, however. The big difference is, and I did this not long ago for this reason, I went multiple weeks without it. And let me tell you something, the first couple days were bad. They weren't quite getting off my medications or like, you know, when I was at my worst, but they weren't good. I mean, they were bad. The withdrawal was not fun. And then I was fine. And then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to go back to drinking coffee now. So the difference I think there is, is this overblown idea of the negative effects of this, right? I know the positives. I am am much more, uh, I I am much more myself in the morning. I'm I'm at my desk by 8.30 doing the stuff I like to do and I'm doing it better, whether that's writing, editing an episode, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I'm there and I'm doing it. When I don't have it for a couple of weeks, I don't feel as productive and and getting off it sucks, but it's kind of worth it. You know, to to get going. I mean, it was worth it in terms of if that's the only negative is that's the only downside is getting off. It sucks. Well, all right. If I miss it for a couple of days, I'll not feel great and I'll be grouchy to be around. But I'm 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 okay with that. Sure. I mean, I guess I don't necessarily feel as if we, you know, everything we do need to be maximizing for our most productive society. <laughs> but like I. And I think we've sort of been like, you know, moving away from that. I do think that there is something to be said for like having a society in which people like for me, one of my biggest principles and like things that I value is a feeling of autonomy and feeling as if you have control over your body, your life, you know, like and, you know, your to some degree your society. Right. And I think that drugs feels really at odds with this notion of autonomy that that's the thing that is like really the thing that makes me most uncomfortable about it and i want people to feel empowered to kind of like live the way they actually want to be living and having a dependency feels so at odds with that but so to to two two questions i guess number one mm-hmm. i guess is about first off i didn't know you didn't drink which makes your dancing at, at the conference even more amazing so i have to say that <laughs> uh, but number two uh is is all dependence is all dependence bad? Because again, the, the example I used at the beginning of I let's say, me this morning, I woke up stressed out and anxious and I did all my mindfulness and I was still struggling to get to a point where I felt okay. And so I smoked CBD again, was still mentally clear because there's, there's no, I mean, there's very little amounts of THC in it. I, I could have still driven. I could have still done whatever, but I felt better. And in that case, I am dependent on that. I needed that to to be a better version of myself today. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Well, see, that's the thing is I feel like this is where it's like a really kind of morally like ambiguous question is like, you know, is getting yourself up to a baseline that the rest of society is that like, I feel like, especially when we talk about prescription drugs, that's considered fine. And then trying to do go above that level, right, is considered bad. I, I agree. And I think that I think that that's more worrisome is that why is that arbitrary line? I go I agree with your point earlier. If the line was, well, now you're productive, that's a terrible line. Forget that. Some days I just need to be relaxed. I need to go do my shit. I don't have to worry about work today. I don't really care about people's view of me as productive. But for a long time, 
In fact, this is still probably the case in many of these big trading firms on Wall Street. Cocaine was seen as okay because you know, a very unhealthy relationship with cocaine, I mean, because it made them more productive. And in that in that case, the baseline is so much higher that getting up to it is actually a bad well, thing. Well, I mean, that's the thing is, like, I think on a broader level, like, my issue is mainly with the society and the fact that, like, we need to do all of these things to cope with this society that we're in that's increasingly asking us to do things that we were not designed to do, asking us to do things that are, like, that, that are just causing obviously unprecedented levels of like depression anxiety and like various other sort of mental illnesses right and like we need to sort of like drug ourselves to cope with that and so the thing that i really react like against is like you know this vision of like okay well like you know if you know in this slippery slope society i don't want to be living in a society like you know 100 years down the line or something in which like we literally all need to just be on drugs to cope with living in the world you know what i mean which we already kind of are. I think that people can use drugs recreationally and one, not form a dependency on it. Or two, if you do form a, form a dependency on it, you know, maintain a healthy, maintain a healthy relationship with it. And I think that if I, you know, if someone chooses to, um, you know, have, you know, if Jay is going to have his whiskey on the rocks after this podcast, you know, I trust that he's going to do it because he is trying to chill and kick it, you know? And I think that that, that that there's nothing inherently wrong with that, you know? Well, I, not only am I trying to ch- chill and kick it, I truly enjoy a good whiskey. And so Same. to me, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's less about the getting fucked up. In fact, that's not a thing that's going to happen. It's more, I'm going to sit down to dinner with my wife and drink a delicious, delicious glass of whiskey, you know? And in that case, the, 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 the alcohol intoxication is secondary to, to enjoying a delicious drink. Um, and, and, you know, I am on both sides of that, right? I, it's, it's been years since I've been like truly fucked up. Uh, but I used to do that all the time. And that is, that would be in that case, I was not dependent. I was not by any definition, uh, addicted, but I did misuse it. And so I, I, I think that this goes back to a point I made earlier that it is a very personal relationship and there are very few other things that we sort of try to legislate in this way. You know, some of them have already been addressed, sex work and all that. But a lot of these things are deeply personal relationships that you have with yourself and with your body. And just because it offends, you know, uh, mo- mostly, let's be honest here, old white people's sensibilities, we've decided to outlaw them. Yeah, I mean, I think those things are true. Um but I, yeah, I definitely just, I do share that vision that you talk about, like of like, you know, I, a society in which we get ever more and more and more powerful drugs and, you know, they become way more attractive than sort of like living in reality feels like a, a dystopian but, world to me. So two things. Number one, I, we're going to talk offline how you exist in this world without coffee and alcohol. I honestly <laughs> want to know. But, but number two is... This is something I got to give a shout out to my good friend, ML Lanzalotta, uh, that he is pushing for is this realization that for some people, let's be honest, living in this world is not a joy. Living in this world is not a positive. And the likelihood that we're going to make the drastic societal changes in their lifetime to fix it is, I mean, negative, right? We're heading in the wrong direction. And so given that, if they want to get off work and drink, if they want to get off work and in, in some cases use heroin, honestly, who are we to stop them? You know? Well, I think that one thing that a lot of people say is that, oh, well, drugs don't affect other people, right? When they make this argument of like, oh, well, you're not hurting anyone, right? And that I would really, I I always very strongly push back against because I feel like I have absolutely been like, I've known people who have like, been on like psilocybin and like punched his girlfriend. And like, you know, I, I just feel like people who who defend drugs really downplay these like these negatives that happen when people are on drugs and i and i really thoroughly reject that because i do feel like anecdotally i've heard of many many instances of people negatively affecting others while on drugs i think i i think that the point and i'm not going to speak for anyone else but when i you're right i do under represent uh certain dangers however it's usually in the context of recognizing 
that if we were truly worried about health and safety, we would start with the most harmful, which again, as I said earlier, are all legal. And so it's- Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Right, so it's not yeah. it's not that I do not think that there are any ill effects, right? As I said earlier, I work with populations where you see them in real time. But I guess what we're weighing here is a society that for most of these people, you know, quite frankly, the average person who we use as the poster child for struggling with addiction ain't me, you know, and there's a reason for that is because we're trying to use these people who, again, we're, we're kind of creating scare tactics here, right? That's what addiction look like. And it looks like, and it's the, the guy hunched over on the street corner. I mean, that is for some people, but I am much more the average person than, than that guy is. And so our entire image of this issue is completely distorted. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think we definitely need to. I mean, it's just so hard to like feel as if anything around it isn't propaganda, but like, you know, more actual research on what is truly causing the problem. And yeah. that would only benefit everyone. Yeah. Can I, I shout out a couple people who are doing that then since you yeah. brought up that, that important yeah, point? Yeah, please do. Uh, so first off, as we mentioned earlier, Chasing the Scream is the book that that mediocre movie was based on. Uh, the book itself is wonderful. Johan Hari spent three, four years uh, getting to know every stage of drug use from uh, Mexican cartels all the way to street sellers in Baltimore. So incredible book. Um, I would also want to shout out, uh, as I said before, Carl Hart. He's one of my heroes. I just finished uh, David Poses, Poses is, P-O-S-E-S, uh, 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 The Weight of Air, which is incredible. Um, Adi, Adi Jaffe, who wrote um, uh, it, it, The Abstinence Myth, which is examining a lot of these uh, societal impacts and the way we think about substance misuse and recovery is just being flat out wrong. Uh, I could go on for day. I mean, this is my passion, right? This is what I do. Uh, but but these are a good place. Oh, one more. Uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, who works with uh, people struggling with addiction. His book is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. If there's two books that made me do what I do, it's, it's Adi. Jaffe's and Dr. Gabor Mate. So check those out. One more because this was really important. The new the new Jim Crow, uh, Michelle Alexander, you probably heard of that one. It got bestseller status. Uh, it's a hard read because it's dense, full of knowledge, but she outlines how the war on drugs is the new Jim Crow. Uh, so, so thank you all for, for, for giving me that opportunity. Please go check out those books. The last thing I do want to say, and I say this every time I speak because it's so important to me, is there's a reason I do this, right? I mean, 11 years ago in in uh, 36 hours, I attempted suicide twice and lived through an overdose. Uh, this is very personal to me. I know how hard it can get. <laughs> Literally, it is impossible to get lower than those 36 hours. If you are struggling, know that number one, there is somebody in your life who cares. I made that mistake. Please don't do it. If you truly do not think there's anybody who will be there for you again, I'm telling you, you're wrong. But if you truly feel that way, please reach out to me. I say this every time I'm interviewed, every time I speak, because I have lost too many people close to me. Like I said, when we started doing this, I was just reading this di diary I wrote while I was in the mental institution. And the saddest part to me is reading about these incredible people who impacted me there. Almost all of them are gone. I mean, I, I can go on Facebook and every one of their pages is now a remembrance page. And it makes me feel even luckier that I'm still here considering all these people I was in that mental institution with are gone. So please reach out. You can find me on social media, uh, search Jay Schiffman or choose your struggle. And uh, find me at my website if you want to, jayshiffman.com. But just know I did this last year during COVID. I put this call out last March and on social media on my podcast. And I was flooded with calls because so many people were struggling. But just because as many people aren't struggling now doesn't mean there aren't still a lot of people hurting. So if you need someone to be there, please reach out. I will drop everything I promise. First of all, Jay, thank you so much. Um, always fun like running through i mean this is this is a topic that i feel like we legitimately haven't touched and i feel like that rarely happens on the show because we're you know more than 100 episodes deep so thank you so much my ending question is you know as you know as the as the coronavirus 
is, you know, I, I this this question is becoming a little bit out of date because Delta is happening. But my question was, you know, as people are getting vaccinated and the world is opening up again, are you doing have you done anything that's like dope that you were excited to do? or Are you excited to do anything? And now the question is, have you gotten to do the thing? Because it seems like we're going to maybe might not be able to do the thing for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So, so one going to Nashville and being at pod movement where I got to finally meet a development person was, was amazing for me. It changed a little bit the way that we did outreach up here in, with, with the, the communities experiencing homelessness that, that are just ignored by the city of Philadelphia, the, the ability to be hands on again and not be. And now, obviously, we're recording this with Delta raging again, and that's a little worrisome. But there is that thing at the back of your mind when you see somebody overdosing. Obviously, you know, I drop everything and go anyways, and I'm really lucky so far. I've not had to narc in anyone myself. I've always been the second or the third person to somebody. So um, I, I honestly I'll, I'll admit this here. I am terrified for the first time. I actually have to do it all myself. I am terrified. However, I'm still going to do it even with COVID raging. But it does change that calculus a little bit because you're not as worried about, you know, that person's life obviously comes first. But when before I was vaccinated, I, I was so scared that I was going to have to, in that split second, choose, do I risk it and help, try to help this person? And I was lucky I never was in that that position. And I, I am so thankful for the other people that I do this with who made the right choice in that moment and still help people. Um, so I would say that is the number one for me, is at least being a little less worried now that I'm vaccinated about dropping to a knee and, and giving someone Narcan and mouth to mouth if they need it, uh, which again, you know, praying to this God, I don't believe in that. I don't have to do that anytime soon. <laughs> um, that's a great answer. That's probably the most thoughtful answer anyone's ever given to that question. It's it, mm -hmm. typically people don't tie their response to that back to the, th the theme of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I look, I, I live this shit, you know? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. I'm going to see John Mulaney in a couple that's weeks. Uh, that's going to be amazing. I love John Mulaney. But, uh, you know, the, the other stuff. I hope he's doing first. better. Because he was in rehab for a little bit, right? Yeah, me too. Um, all right. Well, Jay, this is your time. Please uh, plug whatever you want to plug. I started the Choose Your Struggle podcast in January of 2020 because my background is public speaking. And when COVID was starting to, to be a real thing, I was like, well, how do I still have this impact you know, in the next year? So I started this show and uh, through hard work and a lot of luck, as you all know, uh, it's taken off. And I've been able to interview some people that previously were like, dreams you know what i mean um i don't know when this is coming out but the one i'm dropping this week is with justine ang fonte who was recently on the front page of the new york times after she was forced to resign for teaching sex ed in new york city i i was just so amazed like before this podcast i would never have been like oh reach out to her we should probably have a conversation now i was like hey justine let's chat and she of course said yes and that's the world of podcasting so um you know it's been an absolute blessing for me and, and the most important thing i think is uh as i said uh, isabel when i spoke at, at pod thumb is the responses i get from people i'll never forget the email i got from a guy in nigeria who said you know where i'm from where i live we don't get to talk about these issues this is my outlet it done right i mean no, nothing else i do matters as much as getting that email that's the one so um it is it is to me incredibly important to have that impact on people and uh that's why i keep doing it even though it's hard work and and, and you know you all know how that is yeah um, and as always, you can find us at I'm the Villain Pod. That's our Twitter, that's our Gmail, and that's our Instagram. Otherwise, bye everyone. <laughs>